Well, good morning and welcome to FBC. We're so glad you're here. As we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Um, God, we, we want to invite you. Um, we want to uh, welcome you. Uh, we want to worship you this morning. And I just pray that you would turn our hearts uh, to, to just be able to look back in our lives and, and say, you are good. You've always been good, even in um, tragedy, even in um, the best of times. And we, we want to we celebrate um, your faithfulness this morning. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together. be seated.
Um, as you all know, it's the end of May, which means it is graduation time. This morning, we're going to recognize five seniors and um, departing us move on to adulthood. So um, I just want to say I, I enjoyed these seniors. I, it's really been a pleasure getting to know them this year. Um, they're probably the best seniors. First Baptist is this is the only group of seniors you've ever known at First Baptist. That's true. That's a good point. That's that this church has ever had, arguably. Give them a gift, and then you guys can cheer and go wild, and we'll pray for them, and that'll be the end of it, all right? Okay. Melter, David Arnold, and Marquise Queen. Okay, and if you all want to come up on stage real quick, and if any people come up and pray with us, we're just going to pray over the students. If you all want to come up, um, we're just going to say a quick prayer for all of these um, awesome Jesus, we just thank you for this morning for these um, five seniors who are um, graduating from high school this year. We just thank you for, first of all, their, their families that have um, brought them to church, that have raised them with a uh, Christ-centered family unit, Lord, that they um, understand God's word, that they know God's word, that they um, are leaving with, a, with an understanding of the true gospel, Lord. We thank you so much for each one of these individuals, and we are so excited to see what you're going to do with each one of them, Lord. I pray that um, you would bless each one of them, that you would protect each one of them as they um, depart on adulthood, and that they would um, be lights in this world, that they would be truly um, gospel impactors for your kingdom. We thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So at this time, uh, let's pray for the offering, uh, and then we'll continue in worship together. Um, God, we thank you for what you're doing in the lives of, of these seniors, and I just pray uh, that you would do greater and greater things uh, for your glory through their lives. And I just pray that you bless the offerings, the gifts that are given. We're so grateful for um, how you're giving us opportunities to go on mission to impact your kingdom, uh, because it's really all about that. Your kingdom come, your will be done for the glory of Christ in this world and here in Lancaster. And, and we just ask this, uh, your blessing uh, in, in your name. Amen. Would you please stand uh, after the take offering? Sorry, you can stay seated for now. Uh, and then afterwards, let's stand and worship together.
changes not thy compassions they fail not as thou hast been thou forever will be summer and winter springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Give it to God, you are so faithful, and we're so grateful that you're faithful, even when we're not. And I just pray that you would bless uh, Pastor Chris as he comes to speak. Uh, Just pour out your spirit on him and through him. Uh, Pray that we continue to worship through the hearing of your word. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. If you'd like to open your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy, we're going to begin a new series today, and we're going to go through um, the entire book of 2 Timothy in four weeks, and it's, it's going to be uh, a really, um, I think, powerful um, four weeks, but the, this book is perfect for the occasion because we are, grad, are uh, recognizing our graduates today, and 2 Timothy um, goes very well with that recognition on um, the young man in this story, Timothy, um, he's, he's essentially been pushed out on his own. He's a young man, a young Christian who is in a situation um, in this book where he is going out on his own for the first time. And today as we recognize these high school graduates, we are recognizing young men and women that are going out into the world for the first time, that are beginning adulthood, who are going to be on their own 
we're called as believers to live out their faith and to be lights in a world which desperately needs it and impact the world for Christ. So as we look this morning at the book of 2 Timothy, we're going to be focusing on encouragement. Encouragement to finish. 2 Timothy was written, Apostle Paul, to a young man named Timothy. Um, Timothy is, young, is Paul's young protege. Paul calls him his spiritual son in the faith. To give a little background as to where we are. The book of 2 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul while he was in jail in Rome. The jail he was in in Rome is called the Maritime Prison, and it was a pretty dirty place. It was a pretty disgusting place. It was essentially a giant hole in the ground, a large hole in the ground that um, he had to sit in for an extended period of time. And even to this day, you can still go visit this prison. It's still there. Um, he was there in the mid-60s AD, so it was a little while ago. But um, it was very deep underground, and the way that this prison was was there were layers. There was a separate floors going down this dark hole, and it was of dank and and it was damp. It was, it was a gross place, and that's where Paul had to sit. He would be consigned to a dark, damp, sewage-like environment. It was a really gross place when he decided to write his second letter to Timothy. So let's back up a little. How do we get to this point, okay? How do we get to the point where Paul's writing this letter to Timothy in jail? So Paul met Timothy while he was on his first missionary journey in Acts 16. At the time, Timothy, a very young man, um, his mother a believer, his dad a pagan. But young Timothy was a believer, and he felt he had a calling, and people felt that he also had a calling. So they told Paul about this young man, Timothy. So Paul took him under his, be under his wing. He, he felt an urge to grab young Timothy and say, I'm going to follow, or I'm going to have you follow me. I'm going to show you what it means to be a true follower of Christ. At Timothy began to accompany Paul. He began to um, watch him as he went out and planted churches, led people in Christ, shared the gospel. A time that Timothy truly felt and was confirmed of the fact that he was going to go into ministry. He felt he was somebody who God had called to be in pastoral ministry in the role of pastor. So Timothy, not long after that, was put in charge of the church at Ephesus. He was put in charge of a church. He was a, a very young man still, and he didn't feel equipped, but Paul sent him out. He said, I feel that you are ready to go out and do this. So he put him in charge of a church in Ephesus that he was very reluctant to do. Um, not long after that, Paul gets imprisoned in Rome for the first time. So this is prior to writing 2 Timothy. Paul gets thrown into jail in Rome for the first time around 60 AD, and it was a pretty lax um, jail term. He had house arrest. He was allowed to have visitors. He had, um, was, was freely allowed to do whatever he wanted, essentially. He just pretty much had to stay in this house. So he had tons of visitors come. He had a very good situation, and it was during that house arrest that he wrote Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. So he he was a busy guy during this time, right? He was a very busy guy during these first uh, couple years in house arrest. And it was, it was right after he got out of that house arrest in 62 AD that Paul um, decided to write this letter, the, the first letter to Timothy. He wrote it to him, trying to encourage him to lead the church at Ephesus. So Paul continues his ministry for a few more years, planting churches, discipling, whatnot. And then in 66 AD, we turn back to where we are for this book. We turn back to the story we're at right now. In 66 AD, Paul gets arrested again, but this time it's a totally different situation. The Emperor Nero has decided to um, scourge Christians. He wants them gone. He wants them eliminated. Um, he, he pretty much started a war against Christianity, and Christians are being persecuted severely at this point. Christians are being tortured. They're being killed. So Paul gets arrested here and if you've read a history book, you can see just how bad the persecution of Christians was by Nero. Um, but if you, if you ever do read that, you'll see how bad of a situation Paul was in. So Paul gets arrested. He gets thrown into this jail, this underground dungeon. And it's here that he would go back full circle and he starts to write his letter to 2 Timothy. So Paul, sitting in that dank, sewage-filled dungeon, sits down and writes one more letter to Timothy. And here's the thing. Here's a significant part of this. Paul knows he's about to die. Paul knows he's about to die. This is his final will. This is his last letter. 
You might say it's, it's, his, it's him passing the baton to young Timothy, telling the next generation what he wants to say, the last thing that he wants the, new, the young, younger generation of leaders to know before he leaves this earth. Paul is passing the, the baton to his protege, his beloved son, and the letter he writes to Timothy is filled with encouragement, doctrinal truth, commands to stay firm in the faith, and ultimately to finish the race. And that's the theme of this book. This book is to finish the race. That's what this is all about. Paul says in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. So Paul has fought the good fight. Paul has finished the race, right? Paul is there. He's telling Timothy how he can also get there, and by extension telling us how we can get there, how we can finish the race. It's this incredible man, Paul, offering up his final words to a young, timid man named Timothy. And it applies just as much to us today as followers of Christ as it did to Timothy. So if you have your Bible and you have 2 Timothy open, we're going to start in verse 1 and read through the entire chapter. 2 Timothy 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, for the sake of the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Remembering your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I recall your sincere faith, that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now, I am convinced, is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus, this, this purpose and grace which has been given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, this has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher, and that is why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me, in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that all in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he obtained mercy from him on that day. You know very well how much he ministered at Ephesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for um, just this time to come together and to worship you. Thank you for these graduates that were recognized this morning. We thank you for every single person in this building, Lord, that you would just bless each one of us as we um, come to serve and worship you, Lord, that you might use us in a mighty way, that your spirit might be working in this room and in the life groups, Lord, that you might be changing hearts, transforming lives, bringing about sanctification in each one of us, Lord, that we might leave here today with a heart that is even more in love with you, even more um, desirous to serve you and to put you above all else, Lord. I pray that we might be encouraged in the faith and that we might strive to finish the race as uh, Paul reminds us in this book. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so obviously I said the theme of this book is finishing the race, right? So this, 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 this first chapter I like to call Be Encouraged to Finish the Race, okay? Be Encouraged to Finish the Race. So I have five truths I want to show, five truths of encouragement that Paul um, gives young Timothy in this book that I really want to look at and we will dive in. Number one, be encouraged to your, by your family in Christ. 
be encouraged by your family in Christ, verses 1 through 5. Paul opens this letter as he does with all of his letters with a customary personal greeting. He first addresses himself as the writer of the letter, calling himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. So right there, he's saying who he is. He's saying, I am truly an apostle. I am one of the true followers, the first followers of Jesus Christ who, is, who has been in his presence. And in verse 2, he writes this to his beloved child, Timothy. Grace, peace, and mercy to you. Verse 3, Paul thanks God for young Timothy. He says, Lord, I thank you so much for Timothy. He says he thinks of him and prays of him constantly. He's affirming Timothy. Son, as his beloved child. He's trying to, trying to build Timothy up. He mentions that he prays for him constantly. And he's his mentor. Right? Paul is telling him that he's his mentor. Paul says, I am your mentor. I am like a father to you. I want to build you up in the faith. That's what Paul's trying to do here. And then he reminds him of something critical. And this is verses 4 and 5. And this is really where this point comes from. In verses 4 and 5, he reminds him of Timothy's family. He reminds young Timothy of who his family is. Two families. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. The two families that Paul mentions here are his biological family and his spiritual family. His biological family. Paul reminds Timothy of the people God has placed in his life. His biological family who raised him up in the faith. His mother and his grandmother who were part of um, the church who raised him up to know the sacred writings, right? And that wasn't obviously the New Testament per se. It was the Old Testament, but he knew God's word at that time. He was familiar with what God's word said. And his second family, his spiritual family, Paul is his spiritual family. Paul is his spiritual father, his spiritual mentor, right? One of his closest friends in the faith. And these people are all for Timothy. They're there to support him. They're there to see him thrive. That's what they want, right? That's what they want. They want to encourage him to grow in the faith. They equipped him to do so, and they want to encourage him to continue to do so. So Paul, as he's writing this, is trying to remind Timothy of all these godly people that the Lord has placed in his life so that he will be encouraged and know he's got people who are behind him, who want to see him succeed, who are praying for him who only want to see the best out of him. And that's an incredible blessing. And a lot of us have that too. We should have that. That should be an encouragement for each one of us, that we have family who encourage us in the faith. That's not necessarily meaning biological. A lot of us do have biological families, biological parents, biological brothers, sisters, um, children, who encourage us in the faith, who want to see us succeed. And that's such a blessing. Like students, kids, when you're a kid and your parents raise you up, in the faith, you don't see very often as a kid, right? You don't really think, I'm so glad I was homeschooled, right? You don't really think that per se. A lot of kids don't. But over time, you see that that was an incredible blessing. You will see, I am so grateful that my family was there to raise me up, knowing God's word, to live for the Lord, to help me understand these truths before I went out in the world. That's an incredible blessing that a lot of you were privileged to have. Um, I didn't necessarily have that in my own life, but I have a spiritual family who was there for me after I became a Christian, who were my closest friends at that time, who were there to build me up and encourage me. I had a mentor when I was a young Christian named Fred, and uh, we'll just call him Fred. We started meeting and talking, and I got very close with, young, with, with Fred. He wasn't young, I was young. And Fred started pouring into me. He really started pouring into me like it shocked me. How much he was willing to put into me it was it was really shocking he was an elder in a church he still is an elder in a church and he's been in christ for for decades he became a christian in his late teens he's around 60. 16 or 17 years ago fred lost his son to drugs it was a crazy situation but his son was shot by the police and killed um and you might think that that might make you angry or hostile to god or say you know god turn your back on god but Fred, through his grief at the memorial service, in tears, preached the gospel to these thousands of people who came to see this memorial happen, and people got saved. People got saved at this memorial. He 
use that opportunity to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's just the kind of person that Fred was. That still blows my mind today that he was that in for Christ. He was all in for Christ. He became even more devoted after that. He sold a successful HVAC company, and he began doing full-time ministry, going into prisons, jails, nursing homes, homeless shelters, um, helping addicts. He, 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 he retired from his work to pursue ministry full-time, however he could. And watching Fred live like that, him inviting me on all of these different ministry opportunities to go into the jails, to go into the homeless shelters, to help other addicts who were struggling, right? All of these things. Fred brought me along to watch him do that, and that's how I learned how to do that. And I can look back and say, I'm so grateful that I had Fred in my life. I still am eternally grateful that I had Fred in my life. That was a man who was, like Paul, willing to just pour into a young man and help him become a follower of Christ, a strong follower of Jesus Christ. He had a big part in me entering into pastoral ministry. He promoted, he promoted me to do that. He encouraged me to do that. He's like a spiritual father to me, and I'm eternal grateful for that. But what I'm saying is, find your Paul, find your Fred, find someone who can dive and pour into you if you're a young person. We need those people to really dive into us, to pour into us, to help us along the way. That's what discipleship is supposed to look like. We're supposed to have spiritual family who are willing to help us and motivate us and encourage us and build us up in the faith. And likewise, if you're on the opposite end of the spectrum, if you're an older, more mature Christian, find a Timothy, right? Find someone that you can pour into, that you can help, that you can build into. Right now, why aren't you doing that? There's so many young people in this church who so desperately need that kind of um, mentor in their life, who desperately need someone to pour into them and, and raise them up as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay, number two, be encouraged by your spiritual gifts in Christ. It's verse number six. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So Paul says, fan into flame the gift of God. What, what's he getting at here? That's kind of a weird sentence, right? What Fan the flame the gift of God. Well, first Paul says, for this reason, fan the flame into gift of God, meaning Timothy's genuine faith. The gift of God is his genuine faith and the gifting that God has given him in the faith. We each have a spiritual gifting, right? We each have something that God has given us uniquely to live the Christian life. We don't all have the same gifts, but we each have unique gifts. We all have giftings. And what he's telling Timothy here is to utilize those gifts to fan that flame, to build those gifts up, right? To, like a fire spreading, make those, those gifts in your life spread, make them grow, utilize them more and more. Timothy obviously has the gift of leadership, the gift of, uh, of shepherding and teaching, since he's a pastor. But he's struggling, right? He's a timid guy. He's really struggling at this point. And what Paul's trying to say is to make that fire grow and build. Don't let it go out, right? Don't let that fire go out. Don't let that heart and zeal to serve the Lord go away. That's the last thing that he wants to happen. He has a gift, but he's struggling. He's doubting whether he can really do it. He doesn't have confidence in himself. So Paul is trying to tell him here, fan that flame, build that gift. He's not saying, look for a gifting. He's saying, build up the gifting that you already know you have, right? Build up the gifting you already, it's not something to restart, it's something to recommit. Recommit what you know you have, what you've been affirmed in the faith. He doesn't need a new flame, he needs to rekindle the flame that he already has. So Paul then reminds him on the, by saying, through the laying on of hands, he's affirming that he had that gift and that the church likewise said, we know you have this gift and we're going to send you out and we're going to commit you to this position in the church, right? That's what we should be looking for. We should be looking for affirmation of our giftings, right? People will tell us, this is what I think you're very strong at, right? We need other people to affirm our giftings, to tell us when we are right and when we're wrong, when our, when our giftings are, are definitely on point and when maybe we're, we're trying to do a gift that we maybe aren't equipped for. That's what we need to be focusing on with our spiritual giftings. What gifts do you have? Think about the giftings that you have and how are you using those gifts? What are you doing to utilize those gifts? Each one of us 
has a unique gifting from God. Each one of us has something that God has individually placed in us so that we can serve the church. We're not all called to be pastors, right? We're not all called to, to serve in this way or that way, but we are called to serve in some way. And let me tell you, this church needs a lot of help with service. This church needs a lot of people to help serve, right? We need more people in so many different areas, right? We need people in children's ministry, youth group, volunteers to help watch children. We need security team. We need volunteers to be greeters. We need teachers. We need people who um, can take other people to coffee and be disciple makers. We need all of these kinds of people in this church. And I know in this room, there are people with each one of those giftings who could be a vital part of this church. So the question is, are you using your gift? And if you're not, why not? What's holding you back? The church so desperately needs it. And if you're, in, if you're a part of this church and you're not utilizing that gift, then the church is just lacking because it doesn't have something that it should have within the body by which God has given this church, the people God has given this church. What's holding you back? Can you spare an extra hour in the week for Christ to help build up God's kingdom, to glorify the one who gave you eternal life? I'm sure you can. Okay, point number three. Be encouraged by your courage in Christ. Verses 7 through 9. So in verse 7, Paul points to an area of struggle for young Timothy. Timidity. Timothy struggled with confidence, and he struggled with assurance, and he just doubted himself and doubted that he could do what he knew he needed to do. There was so much backlash. There were people that were so against what he was doing that were straying off course, and he was just kind of overwhelmed this young pastor who had uh, taken on a big responsibility. But Paul tells Timothy he did not receive a spirit of timidity and fear when he was God called him into ministry. He received a spirit of power. The spirit gives power, confidence, love for God and others, and self-control. A life of holiness will be produced in a spirit well believer. Right? So these are the things that Paul's trying to remind Timothy of to encourage him, to remind him what he has in the Spirit, through the promise of the Gospel, right? In Christ, the Spirit gives us power. The Spirit gives us courage. We should have a fear of God that far surpasses the fear of man, right? We should have a courage that is willing to risk anything for the sake of the Gospel. That's why Timothy can have courage and strength, because it's not on him, right? We might think we're not courageous, we don't have courage, and that might be true, but with the Spirit, we do have courage because it's not us, it's God. It's the Spirit inside of us. He's the one doing it. It's supernatural, right? That's the part that we can rest in, that God will give us courage that maybe we didn't know we had because He is more powerful than our struggles, than our trials and tribulations. And here's the key at the end of verse 8. Suffer for the sake of the gospel by the power of God. Paul's encouraging Timothy to live a courageous life to continue fighting for the faith, even though so many around him are apostatizing, are straying away from the truth, living in sin, falling away. It's all over. That's why Paul felt the need to write this message. Paul reminds him that with the Holy Spirit, Timothy can endure all of it. He can continue on. He can persevere through the struggles he's facing. He has the power to overcome all of it in Christ and make an incredible impact for the kingdom. That power of the Spirit that called us to live different in this life, to be holy and set apart. Finally, because God has called us to that life as his child, because it's God's purpose that we be holy and set apart, we have certainty that it will happen, that God will work in us in amazing ways. This Holy Spirit will give us courage, plus all of the fruits of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will cause us to be changed, to be someone that can persevere for the sake of Jesus Christ, to be a light in the world of darkness. I'm sure some of you have heard the name Richard Wormbrand before. Richard, some of you, some of you know that name. He was a Romanian Christian minister who lived from the early 20th century, like around 1910 till 2001. But what, uh, what Richard did that um, has gained a lot of notoriety is he, he was a, a young Christian ministry, minister who watched his home country of Romania be overtaken by the communist Soviet Union in the, in the mid-20th century. 
And shortly after taking Romania, the Soviet Union attempted to overtake and overhaul the church. They wanted to run the church their own way. They wanted people to follow what they wanted them to believe, right? That was their end game there. They wanted total control over individuals. So when that happened, Richard, instead of just going with in order to not cause a fuss or not get in trouble, Richard started a underground church ministry. He started a ministry under, underground, not, not literally a big hole, but he started an underground ministry, something secretive that he could minister to the Christians in the country, all over the country. He was trying to continue to build up the body of Christ, even through these, these terrible um, trials that they were happening, that were happening all around him at that point. He was sharing the gospel with soldiers even. He was willing to do what he needed to do to help the gospel spread. He also publicly rebuked the communist regime and said that Christianity would never be compatible with communism. And they didn't like that. They didn't like him saying that. And so he got arrested and he got thrown into prison. And he got thrown into prison for a long time. He was in prison for 14 years. And I don't know if you ever heard of his book, Tortured for Christ. Some of you have probably seen that. They give it out free a lot. But Tortured for Christ is the book about detailing Richard's life during this time. And he lays out the, the graphic abuse that he faced because of his faith, because of his follower, being a follower of Christ. He faced terrible abuse. He faced beatings. He faced torture. He faced very graphic um, instances of abuse that you can read in that book. But none of it stopped Richard's drive to proclaim the gospel and to see God's kingdom continue to advance. Listen to, listen to this little portion of uh, Richard describing what, is like, what it was like in prison. It was strictly forbidden to preach to other prisoners. It was understood that whoever was caught doing this received a severe beating. A number of us decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching. So we accepted there the communist terms. It was a deal. We preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching, they were happy beating us. Everyone was happy. That was Richard's life in prison. That was, that was what he was willing to do for the sake of the gospel. He was willing to take beatings constantly in order to have the joy and privilege of proclaiming the gospel. So eventually he got out after 14 years. And what did he do? He continued his ministry. Ministry. He went on to start a uh, still present ministry today called Voice of the Martyrs, which I'm sure some of you have heard before. Uh, a ministry uh, dedicated to praying for and um, trying to help persecuted Christians all over the country. So Richard's a Richard is, is the perfect example of what it means to have courage in Christ, right? Richard was willing to pay the cost. Just like the Apostle Paul, he's a shining example for Christian generations to come of what a true follower of Christ looks like, what a courageous Christian looks like in the face of persecution. Every single one of us has the Spirit within us, and we have untapped courage inside of us that we don't even know about. We have more courage than we can even dream of because it's not us, it's God's doing in us. That's the promise, that's the confidence. Listen to, listen to what Matt Chandler says. This is about Christian courage. Courage gives us the ability in this age of unbelief to speak positively and to seek unity, to love those who disagree with us, and to seek, and seek to malign us, to be unsurprised and not angered when a society that rejects Christ does not line up its laws with those of Christ, and to keep on living and seeking to blessed. Courage in Christ gives us the ability to live countercultural, to live countercultural. No matter what the culture is doing, we can stay firm in the faith. Continue to glorify God and be a witness of his gospel at any cost. That's true Christian courage. Okay, number four. Be encouraged that God has given us his truth in Christ. Verses 13 and 14, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Paul's telling Timothy here to follow the sound words that he has heard from Paul about the gospel, from God's word, from the scriptures. Timothy has heard so much, he's been incredibly blessed. He got to listen and hear Paul, who I would love to have gotten to meet Paul or listen or get to see Paul live the Christian life, right? That would have been incredible because he's the shining example of what 
an all-in devoted follower of Jesus Christ looks like. It's, it's incredible just reading Paul's life. So P Timothy had all of this knowledge of God's word. He knew so much. He knew something that much of the world did not know, right? The truth. Timothy knew the truth. He had the gospel, and he held on to the gospel, the absolute truth of scripture. And in verse 13, we see how Timothy is told to hold the truth in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul's saying how Timothy lived with and spoke with others regarding the truth is just as important as how he knows the truth. He's saying as a Christian is just as important as knowing the truth. There should be love. There should be grace. There should be a true change in demeanor as a true follower of Jesus Christ. Right? Though there were false teachers and heresy all around Timothy, though he knew the truth of to seek to reach those people, right? He didn't violently attack anybody. He tried to proclaim the truth in love to try to win them back, right? Not disrespecting them. He tried to do it in love. Timothy was called first and foremost to focus his faith on Christ, and through that focus on Christ, show compassion and love as he directed the church in truth, having patience and living peaceably with others. And Paul then tells Timothy again that there's a supernatural element behind his ability as a follower of Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit inside of him, he is to guard the truth and of the truth of the gospel. He cannot let false teaching, he cannot let heresy um, get inside of him and erode him and remove that truth from him. He cannot let false teaching be something that leads him astray or a sinful lifestyle that leads him astray and turns his back on the truth, right? Those are the two things that will surely cause us to turn our backs on Christ. Living a life of sin, unrepentant sin, and false teaching. Those are the two things that most assuredly will cause us to turn our backs on Christ at some point. We will be choked out spiritually if those things are happening in us. Paul encourages Timothy, telling me as the truth of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. And he tells Timothy to carry on Paul's work by sharing and proclaiming that true gospel to the world, defend himself against the false teaching, and likewise proclaim the truth to those who are trying to spread that false teaching. And in this church, we have that truth inside of us. We all have that truth in our hearts if we are truly followers of Jesus Christ. We proclaim the gospel that Paul proclaimed that that died for for us, for fallen sinners who were made in God's image but strayed from God's plan, who went their own way in rebellion. And now the only means by which we can have relationship with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. Through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, we can have a relationship with God. That's the greatest news ever told. Okay, number five. Be encouraged by those who have finished the race in Christ. By those who have finished the race in Christ. Verses 10 through 12, 15 through 18. The final way that Timothy can find encouragement from this, this writing here in this first chapter is simply by looking at the example Paul is setting for him through his writing. Paul is, is showing Timothy just by his words what an all-in follower of Christ looks like. What somebody who is about to complete the race looks like. In verses 11 and 12, Paul tells Timothy that he was appointed a preacher and teacher, just as Timothy was, and that he is suffering for it as he sits suffering for the sake of the gospel. But look what he says in the middle of verse 12. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Do you hear that confidence, that confidence in Paul? He's so dead set certain of his security in Christ, so certain of the future that he has to look forward to. He's facing his own death as a messenger of Christ, but he is not ashamed. He has no shame in him for the name of Christ. He is, he is grateful to be able to be a martyr for the name of Jesus Christ because he's been saved protected and covered by Jesus Christ. He knows that no matter what happens to him, if he perseveres, which he is doing, that he will have an eternity in paradise 
with his Savior. He will be safe until the end because he rests in God's promises until the end. Right? How encouraging this must have been for young Timothy to see this man who's all in for Jesus persevere till the very end, right? To be writing this letter to him on his, on his deathbed, right? Knowing that he is surely about to be executed, he goes and he writes this letter to Timothy, just trying to build him up in the faith, even knowing he's about to pass away. That's an example for each one of us. That is the example of what a successful runner of the race looks like. Somebody who perseveres till the end and never strays from the truth. He is totally content and at peace and know God is working all things out for his good. That's an example in a timid and be encouraged by. Paul in these verses and really in this entire chapter is emphasizing that Timothy should be encouraged because of the life that he has lived, the life he got to witness as a true follower of Jesus Christ should live, right? He had this mentor, this hero in the faith that he got to watch, that he got to um, be taught by, that he got to experience. It was a blessing for him. I don't know if you guys know the, the portion in 2 Corinthians where Paul says exactly how often he was beaten and abused for the sake of the gospel. It's, it's, it puts Richard Wormbrand almost to uh, shame here. He says in 2 Corinthians 11, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles. Dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from such external things, there is the daily of pressure upon me of concern for all the churches. So this is Paul's life. Just like Richard Wormbrand, you see in this, you see a man who has completed the race, who has finished the race. He knows he's going to be executed. He's faced all of these trials and tribulations. He's struggled for the sake of Christ, and now he knows his reward is finally coming. <clears throat> and in this church, just this past year, I know we've experienced a tremendous amount of death. This church has gone through a more funerals than I've ever seen at a church of this size in this short of a period of time. Just Thursday, we lost another dear brother um, from this church. But here's the thing, while, we, while it's sad on the external, right? While it's sad to think these, these brothers and sisters have passed, right? We can no longer see them anymore. This is a time of celebration because so many of these brothers who have passed finished the race. So many of these brothers and sisters who have passed are now in a place far greater than we can even imagine. We can't even imagine how good of a place these brothers and sisters are in, right? They're, they're in a place that us from earth can only dream of a place that we, we still have to look forward to because God still has plans for us on this earth at the time being. They're in paradise, and we can look forward to that paradise. And we should seek to emulate these brothers and sisters, these brothers and sisters who have finished the race, who lived for God till the end. That's what it's all about, right? That's what it means to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. I know we all know people who maybe didn't finish the race, right? People who started in the, in the likes of being a Christian who went to church, but down the road somewhere, they, they abandoned it all. They, they said, I don't believe this anymore. Or they dove into a lifestyle of sin and abandoned the church altogether, right? You see it all the time. So this is something that we need to realize that people stray from, people don't finish the race all the time, right? People don't finish the race all the time naive and think that you're definitely okay if you don't follow God's word, if you don't serve God, if you don't love God, if you don't love his word, why do you think you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you, has your heart truly been changed? Has there been a transformation in you? Do you love the things of God and hate the things that God hates? Do you want to be a committed follower? Do you want 
to live in holiness? Do you want to glorify God? Do you hate the sin that, that remains in you? Do you want to change? Right? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Check your own heart. Right? Check your own heart to see if you be in the faith. In the faith. So that one day we can be like our dear brothers and sisters who got to go, leave this earth, and hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. So that one day we can be that person. We can say, we have successfully finished the race. So this morning, the question I want to ask you is this. Can you relate with Paul or Timothy in some way? You should be able to. The relationship these two experienced is something each of us should experience in our Christian lives. I'm not saying identical. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying, as a young Christian, have you been seeking to find more mature believers, people that can help you along the path to build relationships with people in Christ, right? Have you been seeking for that? Have you wanted to be part of the body of Christ? Have you made effort in that area? If not, why not? Make, a, make an effort, right? Make an effort. Glorify God. Seek to grow. Run the race with the rest of the body of Christ. If you're like Paul, if you're a more mature believer, can you think of the last time that you went and had coffee with some young person in the faith, somebody that you could go and disciple, someone that you tried to build into, not coffee, anything, that you talked on the phone, that you've made it a priority, say, I'm going to try to build into this young person this week or this month, right? If you, have, if you can't think of something, why not? Why can't you think of something, right? We have time. We can make time for these things. If we make these priorities, it'll happen. Think about those things. Who are you mentoring? Who are you being mentored by? Who are you building into? Who are you trying to help? Who are you trying to hold accountable? Who are you trying to encourage, right? Who? There should be some people, right? There should be some people that you can list on the top of your head that you're trying to do these things with or for. Have you been using your spiritual gifts in the church? We each have gifts. To use gifts that we don't have, it's a matter of using the gifts that we do have, right? So often people try to say, I just wish I had this gift. Well, they have this amazing gift that God gave them and they don't use it. Use the gift that God's given you. Be a member of the church. Build the body of Christ. Serve others. There's always opportunities to serve in the church or other people or for God's kingdom. There are always opportunities. Utilize your gifts. Do you hold on to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you hold on to Christ's finished work for your salvation? Not your own doing you achieve, but the, 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 the achievement that Christ paid for you. Do you hold on to that gospel of Jesus Christ and rest in that assurance of your faith? Do you study God's word? Do you understand the truth of scripture? Do you make it a priority to renew your mind in the faith? So these are the questions I want you to ask yourselves. These are the things I want you to leave with so that your life can make a true difference in God's kingdom, that your life will matter in the long run of eternity, that you can do something for Christ and his kingdom and be a light in this world, making disciples and glorifying God along the way, so that we can each, when the time comes and we leave this earth, hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servants. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this morning, for each of these in worship today. Lord, I just pray that um, the Spirit is working in this room, Lord, in each one of our hearts, that we um, see how incredible the gift you have given us in Jesus Christ is, Lord, that we see the, the seriousness of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And Lord, that we make it a priority to put God above all else in our lives, to have the courage that only you can give us, Lord, that we are willing to put you above everything, Lord, that we, that we will face face persecution for the sake of your name, Lord, that we are willing to pay that price, Lord, that you would give us hearts on fire for you, Lord, hearts zealous disciple makers, Lord, to build into others' lives, to be built up by others, Lord, make us a true minister of your word in our lives, no matter what occupation, Lord, make it a priority that we're a light to those around us, wherever we are. We pray, amen. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, 
worthy of all of thy praise. You overcame. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name. You overcame, and we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word our testimony everyone overcome and we will overcome by the blood of the lamb in the word of our testimony everyone overcome Savior worthy of honor and glory worthy of all of our praise you overcame Jesus Awesome in power forever. Awesome in grace, your name. You overcame. God, I pray you would encourage us and you would help us to overcome. We would rely on, on your gospel and your word. Pray that you'd go with us as we we share with those around us. And we love you. It's in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. You're dismissed.